the highest order in God. A sermon by Smith Wigglesworth. God has come to visit us, and he has revealed himself unto us. But he wants you to be so ready that nothing that he says will miss. He wants to build you on the foundation truth. Are you ready this morning? Because God has something better than yesterday. He has higher ground, holier thoughts, and a more concentrated, clearer ministry. God wants us every day to be in a rising tide. It is a changing of faith. It is an attitude of the Spirit. It is where God rises higher and higher. God wants us to come into the place where we will never look back. God has no room for the man that looks back, thinks back, or acts back. The Holy Spirit wants to get you ready to stretch yourself out to God and believe that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. You don't need to use vain repetition in prayer. Ask and believe. People come with their needs. They ask, but they go away with their needs unmet because they don't faithfully wait to receive what God has promised them. If they ask, they will get it. So many people are missing the highest order. I went to a person who was full of the Spirit, but just kept saying, Glory, glory, glory. I said, You're full of the Holy Spirit, but the Spirit can't speak because you keep on talking. So he kept still, and the Spirit began speaking through him. Live completely in the way of God. Do more believing and less begging. I want to change how you see yourself in God so that you'll know that God is operating through you now and forevermore. May the Spirit awaken us to the deep things today. Are you ready to move and be moved by the mighty power of God that cannot be moved? Ready to be so disciplined and built up until you're in a place where it doesn't matter where the wind blows and what difficulty comes, because you are fixed in God? Are you ready to come into the plan of the Most High God where you are believing what the Scripture says and holding on to what's good, and believing so that no man shall take your crown? God can change us by His Word so that we are completely different day by day. David knew this. He said, Your Word has given me life. He sent His Word and healed me. How beautiful that God can make His Word flourish like that. I have hidden Your Word in my heart so I might not sin against you. It's absolute faithlessness and unbelief to pray about anything that's written in the Word of God. The Word of God doesn't have to be prayed about. The Word of God has to be received. If you will receive the Word of God, you will always be in the greatest place. If you pray about the Word of God, the devil will be behind the whole thing. Never pray about anything which is, The Lord said. His word has to be yours so that you will be built on a new foundation of truth. I want to turn your attention this morning to the sixth chapter of 2 Corinthians. It shows our high position, but there's a lot to look at to make sure that we're rising to the top of these glorious experiences. This is also a groundwork for deep heart searching. This is divine revelation of the distinctive spiritual nature given to us. The writer must have been immersed in this holy place. In the first verse of Romans 12, you'll see that Paul has been mightily under an operation on more than a surgical table. He has been cut to the very depths. And he's reached a place on the altar of full and absolute surrender. And out of the depths of it, when he has gotten there, now he's giving his whole life, as it were, in a nutshell. He says, I urge you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, which is your reasonable service and proper worship. 
from this position, let's look at the sixth chapter of 2 Corinthians and see a beautiful word which can bring us to a very great place of hearing by the hearing of faith. He begins, we then, as workers together with him. It's a collective thought. He's preaching to the whole church in Christ Jesus. Of course, Paul has the Corinthians in his mind because the Corinthian church was the first church among the Gentiles, and he was the apostle to the Gentiles. We then, as workers together with him, we urge you not to receive the grace of God in vain. This is one of the mightiest words there is in the scripture. People are getting blessed all the time, having revelation, and they go from one place to another, but they don't establish themselves in that thing which God has brought to them. If you don't examine your heart when the Lord comes with blessing or correction, if you don't make it a stepping stone or a place to grow from, then you are receiving the grace of God in vain. People could be built up so much more in the Lord and be more wonderfully established if they would move out of their thinking and think about the graces of the Lord. Grace can be multiplied depending on certain conditions. How? In the first chapter of 2 Timothy, Paul refers to Timothy's sincere and genuine faith. Everyone in this place, the whole church of God, has the same precious faith within him. And if you allow this similar precious faith to be the most important and greatest thing in your life, you will find that grace and peace are multiplied. In the same way, the Lord comes to us with his mercy. But if we don't see that the God of grace and mercy is opening the door of mercy and his expression to us, we are receiving it in vain. I thank God for every meeting. I thank God for every blessing. I thank God every time a person says to me, God bless you, brother. I say, thank you, brother. The Lord bless you. I see it's a very great place to have people desire that we're blessed. If we want strength in building our spiritual character, we should never forget the blessings. When you're in prayer, remember how near you are to the Lord. This is a time that God wants you to be stronger, and He wants you to remember He's with you. When you open the sacred pages of the Bible and the light comes right through and you say, Isn't that wonderful? Be sure to thank God, because it's the grace of God that has opened your understanding. When you come to a meeting like this and you get revelation, and it's exactly what you wanted, receive it as a gift of grace from the Lord. It's God bringing you to a place where he can make you a greater blessing. He says, I've heard you in an accepted time, and in the day of salvation, I have helped you. I tell you, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Those are two processes of salvation. He helped you with the Spirit, guiding you while the adversary was against you. And when your friends and neighbors turned on you and everybody rose up in accusation against you, when there were fightings outside and fightings within, he helped you. He covered you until you came to salvation. And then he keeps you in the plan of his salvation. Now is the day of salvation. Here, being saved doesn't mean that you weren't saved, but that you are continually changed in the process of regeneration being made like God being brought into the working of the Spirit's power, being made like Him. This is the day of salvation. He helped you at a time when Satan wanted to destroy you, and He is with you now. This is the day of salvation. If we remain inactive, how we've always been, God has nothing for us. Everybody needs to understand that they have to be in continual progress. Yesterday isn't enough for today. I have to thank God for yesterday, but tomorrow is what I am today. Today is full of inspiration and divine intuition, where God is ravishing the heart, bursting along all the shorelines, and getting my heart responsive to His cry alone where I live and move, honoring and glorifying God in the Spirit. This is the day of visitation of the Lord. This is the great day of salvation, being moved on and moved into 
and moved for God. It is the Lord. Let him do what he seems well. It may be death, but he has life in the midst of death. We will praise and magnify the Lord, for he is worthy to be praised. He has helped us, and now he's building us. Now he is changing us. Now we are in the operation and working of the Holy Spirit. Every day you have to go to a higher ground. You have to deny yourself to move up in God. You have to refuse everything that isn't pure and holy. God wants you pure in heart. He wants your intense desire to be after holiness. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. We don't want to offend in any way, so the ministry won't be blamed. That's lovely. The church can be built, and God will break down things that seem to oppose. If any of you here in Angelus Temple are in a place where you'd rather see one person saved here than two people saved at Bethel Temple, then you are completely wrong, and you need to be saved. If there's anybody here from Bethel Temple, if you would rather see one person saved in your temple than two people saved in Angelus Temple, then you are out of line with the Spirit and the heart of God, and you're strangers to the real holy life with God. If your ministry isn't supposed to be blamed, how will that happen? You have to live in love. Make sure that there is never anything that comes from your lips or actions that will interfere with the work of the Lord. Instead, live in the place where you are helping everyone, lifting everybody up, bringing everybody together into perfect harmony. Remember this, there's always a blessing where there is harmony. Being in one accord together, united, is the essence of the victory that comes to us all the time. There are thousands and thousands of different churches, but they are all one in the Spirit to the degree that they receive the life of Christ. If there's any division, it's always outside the Spirit. The spiritual life in the believer never has known dissension or discord, because where the Spirit has perfect freedom, all agree, and there's no division in the body. The letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. When there's division, it's only there because they take the letter instead of the Spirit. If we're in the Spirit, then we'll have life. If we're in the Spirit, we will love everybody. If we're in the Spirit, there will be no division. There will be perfect harmony. God wants to show us that we have to live in the Spirit like that, so the ministry is not blamed. It is a wonderful ministry that God has given to us because it is a life ministry. Pentecostal perspectives are spiritual perspectives. We recognize the Holy Spirit, but first we recognize the Spirit quickening us, saving us from every influence of evil power, transforming our human nature until it is in divine order. Then in that divine order, we see that the Lord of hosts is beautifully arranging our life until we truly live in the Spirit and not just fulfilling the lusts of the flesh. Don't let your goodness be spoken of as evil, but live in the spiritual life with Christ so that He is being glorified over your body, your soul, and your spirit until your very life becomes symbolic and God reigns over you in love and peace. I like that because I see that when the Holy Spirit has complete control, He lifts, enlightens, and unveils the truth in a new way until we understand it. I'd be thrilled if we all went home today with this word in our heart. Don't let your goodness be spoken of as evil. I know we all want to be good. It's not a wrong thing to want our goodness to be appreciated. But we have to watch ourselves because it is an evil day, even though it's the day of salvation. And we have to understand these days that the Lord wants to humble us and bring His people directly into the fullness He has for them. 
I believe that it's possible for God to sweep a group of people right into the glory now before the rapture, just like it was the rapture. And it's possible for you to be taken in even if others are left. May God grant unto us a very sharp inward discerning of our heart's purity. We want to go. It is far better for us to go. But it's so much better for the church that we stay. If you understand the truth that Paul realized when he said, it's far better for me to go, you'd never take a pill or use a remedy. You would never do anything to save you from going if you believed it was better to go. There is a definite inward motion of the power of God in the human life that could change it so much that we wouldn't lift a finger to save ourselves, believing it was far better to go. Then there's another side to it. Believing that God has us for the preaching of the gospel and for the building of the church, we'd say, Lord, for the purpose of being more of a blessing for your sake and for the sake of the church, just keep us full of life here to stay. We wouldn't be full of disease, but we would be full of life. May the Lord grant us this morning a living faith to believe. But in all things, presenting ourselves suitable as ministers of God in much endurance, in afflictions, in troubles, and in hardship. Now these afflictions are not the afflictions of sickness and disease. Paul is very definite about that. He suffered afflictions at the hands of people. Jesus suffered afflictions the same way. There can even be afflictions within us when we feel that our life in the Spirit isn't growing as fast as we would like and bringing life to others. You have to live in the Spirit to such a degree that when you see the church not rising into its glory, that you have affliction within and feel for the church. And you are sorry and deeply distressed because the church isn't capturing the vision. And there's affliction in your sorrow. God wants us so spiritually tuned in that we could have perfect discernment to know the spirit of the people. If I can in a moment discern the spirit, whether it's bringing life, whether the whole church is receiving it, whether my heart is moved by this power, then I can also see the people weakening, falling back, and I can see faith lessening, and that will bring affliction and trouble to my life. May God help us realize that we are so joined to the church that we feel the burden to lift the church up. Paul said that he travailed like a woman in labor for the people to be formed in Christ again. It wasn't to be saved again. They had just lost understanding. They had missed fellowship of divine order. So he labored again that they might be brought into this deep fellowship of the Spirit. God, help us to see that we can travail for the church. Blessed is the person who can weep between the door and the altar. Blessed is the people of God that can take Angela's temple on their hearts and weep and cry through until the church is formed again, until she rises in glory, until the power of heaven is over her, until the spiritual familiarity rises higher and higher, until the song of heaven lifts them to the heights. This is the way of the church of God, that the ministry would not be blameworthy, but move to a higher height, a glorious truth, and a blessed faithfulness, higher and ever higher. In much patience. Patience. There's a word we need more of these days. I know I'm talking to people who have churches and work in the ministry, but remember this. You never lose so much is when you lose your peace. If the people see that you've lost your foundation of peace, they know you've gotten outside of the position of victory. You have to possess your soul in peace. Strange things will happen in the church, and things can get difficult, and you'll feel that the enemy is busy. When that happens, you must possess your soul in peace. Let the people know that you have a connection with one who, when he was attacked, did not return it back to them. Own your patience so much that you can suffer anything for the church or your friends or for your neighbors or anyone. Remember this, we build character in others as our character is built. Just as we are pure in our thought, 
and tender and gracious to other people, possessing our souls in patience, the people will have a burning desire for our fellowship in the Holy Spirit. Jesus exemplified that concept. They saw him undisturbed. I love to think about him. He helps me so much because he is the very essence of being. In need and distresses, this means spiritual distresses because of the experiences with the church. It is the church we're dealing with here. Paul is in a place where he is breathing forth by divine appointment to the church. The purpose of these meetings is to gather the church together in our common faith. Because if five people could save Sodom and Gomorrah, five holy people in a church can hold the power of the Spirit until His light shines through. We don't want to seek to save ourselves, but lose ourselves, so that we can save the church. You can't help distresses coming. They will come and offenses will come. But woe unto those that cause offenses. See that you do not cause offense. See that you live in a higher current. Make sure that your tongue doesn't stray. Have you ever seen the picture in the 22nd chapter of Luke when the disciples asked, Lord, is it I? Every one of them was so conscious of his human weakness that not a single one of them could say that it would not be he. One of you will betray me, Jesus said. John was leaning on the breast of the Lord, and Peter asked him to find out who Jesus was talking about. He knew if anyone could get to know, it would be John. How long do you think Jesus had known? He had known at least for nearly three years. He had been with them in the room. He had been feeding them. He had been walking with them and had never told any of them it was Judas. The church that follows Jesus should be so sober, sober with a sensitivity that they would never speak against another whether it was true or not. Jesus is the great personality. I love to listen to him. I'm provoked by his holy inward generosity and purity, and also his acquaintance with love. What would it have accomplished if he had told them it was Judas? Everyone would have resented him. So he saved all his disciples from resenting Judas for three years. What love! Can't you see that holy, divine Savior? Today, every one of us would throw ourselves at His feet. If we had a crown worth millions of dollars, we would still say, You are worthy. God, give us such a holy, intense, divine knowing that we would rather die than grieve You. Let us have an inward Savior that makes us say, We'd rather die a thousand deaths than sin once. Oh, Jesus, we worship you. You are worthy. I have gone into the very depths to help you, and in the very depths I called you my own, and I delivered you when you were oppressed and in oppression, and I brought you out when you were sure to sink below the waves, and I lifted you and brought you into the banqueting house. That is the mercy of the Lord. That is the love of the Lord. It is the grace of the Lord. It is the spirit of the Lord. It is the will of the Lord. Be ready. Be alert for God. Live in the Holy Spirit. I can understand how Paul said, I wish that you all spoke in tongues, but rather that you prophesy, unless there's an interpretation. I pray that we learn how to keep ourselves so that we are blended with the Spirit and the harmony will be beautiful. Where there isn't anyone in the place that doesn't feel the breath of the Almighty breathing over us. This is a moment where the Spirit is coming to us saying, don't forget. This is the receiving of the grace of God. Don't go away and forget. You need to go away and be what God intends you to be. In stripes, in imprisonments, in riots, in labors, in sleepless nights, in fastings. Look at how those first apostles suffered. 
and how we suffer together with them. Sweden is a remarkable place in so many ways. When I was in Sweden, the power of God was on me as I was talking about the deep things of God and seeing people healed in every way. And it was there that I was arrested for preaching these wonderful truths. The Lutheran churches and the doctors rose up like an army against me and had special meetings with the king to try to get me to leave the country. And they finally succeeded. It was in Sweden that I was escorted out with two detectives and two policemen because of the mighty power of God moving among the people in Stockholm. But beloved, it was very lovely. One of the nurses in the king's house came to the meetings and she was healed of a leg issue. I forget if it was a broken thigh or a dislocated joint. She went to the king and said, I've been so wonderfully healed by this man. You know I'm walking perfectly now. Yes, he said. I know everything about him. I know all about him. Tell him to go. I do not want him to be kicked out. If he goes himself, he can come back. But if he's kicked out, he can't come back. Thank God I wasn't kicked out. I was escorted out. They went to the police to see if I could have a big meeting in the park on the day after Pentecost Sunday. The policemen joined together and said, there's only one way that we would refuse him. If he lay hands on the sick in the park, it would take 30 more policemen to guard the situation. But if he promises that he won't lay hands on the sick, we'll let you have the park for your service. They came and asked me, and I said, you can promise them that. I know God isn't dependent on my laying hands on the people to heal them. When the presence of the Lord is there to heal, it doesn't require hands. Faith is what matters in the operation of healing. When we believe God, all things are easy. So they built places where I could speak to thousands of people. I prayed, Lord, you know the situation. You've never been stuck in any one place. You know how all things go. Show me how it can be done today without me having to lay hands on the people. Show me. So I said to the people, any of you that want the power of God going through you today, healing everything, put your hands up. Thousands of hands went up. I said, Lord, show me. And he told me as clearly as anything to pick a person out that was standing on a rock. It was a really rocky area, so I told them all to put their hands down except for this woman. I said to her, tell everyone about what you need healing for. She told him that from her head to her feet she was in so much pain that she felt if she didn't sit down or lie down that she would never be able to go on. Lift your hands up high, I said to her. In the name of Jesus, I rebuke the evil one from your head to your feet, and I believe Jesus has set you free. And he did. And you should have seen how she jumped and danced and shouted with joy. That was the first time that God showed me it could be done. We had hundreds saved and healed without touching them at all. Our God is a God of mighty power. And it's so wonderful, so glorious, and so fascinating that we can come into this royal place. This is a royal place. We have such a great God. We have a wonderful Jesus. I believe in the Holy Spirit. In Imprisonments In Switzerland, I went to jail twice for this wonderful work. But praise God, I was brought out all right. The officer said to me, We don't find any fault with you. We're happy with you. We don't have any issue with you because you're such a great blessing to us here in Switzerland. And in the middle of the night, they said, You can go. I said, No, I'll only go on one condition. That is, if every officer here tonight gets down on their knees and I can pray with all of you. Glory to God. Are you ready to really believe the scriptures? That is absolutely necessary. The scripture is our only foundation to properly build on. Christ is the cornerstone, and we are all in the building. I wish I could let you see that wonderful city coming down out of heaven with millions, beyond millions, countless numbers, making up a city coming down out of heaven, prepared as a bride for the Lamb of God. Get ready for that. Claim your rights that God has provided today. Don't let them go. If you hear any divine spiritual insight, believe that it's for you. If you see Christ, believe he is your portion. If you see Paul by the Holy Spirit highlighting your divine position, believe that it's yours. Have faith in God. 
Believe that the scripture is for you. If you want a high tide rising in the power of God, say, Lord, give me what I need so that I won't lack anything. Have a real faith. Believe that his love covers you, that his love flows through you, and that his quickening spirit lifts you. Oh God, take these people into your pavilion of love. Lead them, direct them, preserve them, strengthen them, uphold them by your mighty power. Lead them, direct them, preserve them, strengthen them, uphold them by your mighty power. Let the peace that passes understanding, the joy of the Lord, and the comfort of the Holy Spirit be with them. Amen. 